This recording brought to you by the University of Adelaide. I'm Bruce Dawson, uh, Head of Physics at the University of Adelaide. And first I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of uh, the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses are built. I'm very pleased to welcome His Excellency Rear Admiral uh, Kevin Scares, uh, Governor of South Australia, and uh, Mrs Scares, welcome. Also Professor Mike Brooks, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Vice-President for Research, uh, and Professor Bob Hill, uh, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Sciences. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our uh, special Physics History Symposium today. Uh, our aim is to explore the rich history of physics at the university from about 1948 in a series of talks, uh, but another important function of the day is for all of you to get together with old friends and colleagues and uh, relive those, those great times of the past. We're very thrilled by the number of people that have come today, and, uh, but I would like to mention just a few of the people who have sent their apologies who couldn't attend because they were away or they're, they're not well. Um, they certainly send their best wishes, and, and, and these include the, the Vice-Chancellor of the University, Warren Bebbington, the Head of our School, Derek Lineweber, uh, Ren Keats, Barbara Possingham, Malcolm Elford, John Gascoigne, Don McCoy, Peter Teubner, Brian Matthews, John Jenkin, Ian Tui, Dallas Kirby, Bob Hearn, Bob Nation, Eleanor Hurst, Norm Jones, Laurie Campbell, and Janet Hobbs. I would also like to mention uh, five former colleagues who have passed away in the last year during the planning for this event. Uh, they are Peter Shabella, John Prescott, John Smith, Angus Hurst, and Brian Horton. Um, John Prescott in particular was a, a particular supporter of, uh, of this event and, and was a member of the, our history committee that was organising this function. And Angus Hurst enthusiastically uh, participated in uh, our series of oral history interviews. So it's very sad that these friends can't be with us today. Now let me introduce our opening speaker. Uh, Harry Medlin was born in 1920 in Oruru, South Australia and was educated in Oruru and Adelaide. He attended the Adelaide Technical High School and the South Australian School of Mines before joining the Army in 1938 as a sapper in the Royal Australian Engineers. He rose to the rank of captain and served in Australia and Timor before spending three and a half years as a prisoner of war in Timor and Java. In 1947, he was able to commence his studies at the University of Adelaide and completed an honours degree in physics in 1951, after which he was appointed uh, a lecturer in the physics department. Harry completed his PhD in 1956 and went on to a distinguished career in the university as a senior academic in physics, uh, a promoter of a myriad of causes, and ultimately as senior deputy chancellor of the university. In recognition of Harry's service, he was awarded uh, doctor of the university in 1997, uh, the institution's highest honor. So we are very pleased that Harry has been able to join us today uh, to say a few words to open our physics history symposium. So please welcome Dr. Harry Medlin. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Your Excellency and Mrs. Skiers, uh, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. I was surprised and uh, quite humiliated when asked to open this, uh, uh, this symposium today, and I shall do so in due course. Deo Valenti. Means God willing, in case you don't know. <laughs> well, I got back into physics after 43 months of what our cap captors called a guest of the Imperial Japanese Army of Dai Nippon Gun. Of the 22,376 of us who were captured by the Japanese, over a third at 8,000 died in captivity. They intended to kill us all. And we had to dig our own slit trenches uh, as the war got closer to where I finished up, uh, namely in Java. Uh, but we had secret radios, and we knew of the two atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. The Japanese had a physicist, Yukawa, 
and he was able to tell from the fragments of the two bombs what the parent nuclei were. For example, um, with the bomb dropped on um, uh, um, Hiroshima, he was, he was able to tell, oh, if I got the right page, he was able to tell that the, that the nucleus was, although fissile, and for transuranic to be fissile, it has to be an even odd isotope. It must be an even number of uh, neutrons and an odd number of protons. So the fissile uranium, naturally occurring uranium isotope was uh, 92235. Atomic number 92, atomic weight 235. So he was able to tell the emperor, and we had to pronounce the emperor's name as Hirohito. I think most of, most of you will probably call him Hirohito, but uh, Yukawa was able to tell Hirohito that they might only have one of those bombs and you might have time to negotiate a peace. However, then within a few days, there was a second bomb that fell on uh, Nagasaki. And he was able to tell there that it was plutonium 94239 that had been bred by bombarding the, the abundant but non-fissile uranium isotope 92238. See, they hit it with a, with a neutron. The atomic number went up 1, 2, 2, 3, uh, 9. It then gave off two electrons from the nucleus. And atoms can do that. So the atomic number went up from 92 to 94, and it was plutonium 94239, fissile. And Yukawa was able to say they might now have a hundred, hundreds of these, and you might get the next one on the palace. Well, the emperor then escaped and read the, uh, read the imperial rescript from Radio Tokyo. Now, the emperor in those days was divine. And I've actually seen the uh, script read to the Japanese in, uh, in Java. And it, it was stultifying for them to hear what this divine person had, uh, had said to them. And that was the end of the, end of the war and the end of our, our captivity. Well, I was often in hospital, as some, some of you know, Barbara Kidman, I can see Barbara Kidman Potts, I can see sitting there, often in hospital in 1946, but was reasonably successful. I studied electromagnetism, as did Barbara, with Kerr Grant. And she and I have certainly agreed it was absolutely hopeless. <laughs> part of the time, B was equal to mu H, and part of the time it was mu H over 4 pi, Bob, as you probably, you probably remember. Well, anyway, I gave my honours on a seminar for Prof Huxley a few years later, and I gave it on the electromagnetic field tensor. And I did it so that I could find out about electromagnetism. And I was able to quantify and qualify why gamma squared mu naught epsilon naught c squared is a pure number and it's identically equal to one. Excuse me, Your Excellency, but some of these people are physicists and they know, <laughs> they, they know what I'm talking about. <coughs> Well, then there were two English physicists uh, appointed as the senior lecturers. Firstly, Stan Tomlin, and I see photographs there, and I brought along some photographs, uh, and I'll, I'll leave this here to be copied in case I have some that you don't, uh, you don't have. I, I will certainly have one that I think you probably don't have. It's the physics department approximately in 1951, with uh, Graham Elford and... Uh, all the rest, rest of us, Kerr Grant, Huxley, Bird and Fuller, and, uh, and so on. Well, the, uh, the physics department changed, changed direction with the appointment of Huxley and these two senior, senior lecturers. And uh, it, it changed everything for Gordon Aitchison, Bob Crumpton, Graham Elford, David Sutton, Barbara Kidman, Eric Murray, John Jenkin, and the whole of the rest of us. We rejoined the human race. <laughs> well, my time is limited, and I'll, I'll make three and perhaps four references. The first, uh, the first one is, I was a senior member of the Council Appointment Committee for a Chair of Physics in 1984. 
there were two shortlisted applicants, and I've seen both of them. They're both here today. Uh, they know who I'm, ta I'm, I'm talking about. I asked um, in, the, in the panel, what was the honours classification for Tony Thomas? Because nothing was said about what honours physics award he got at Flinders. It turned out to be the Ian McCarthy, who Graham and Bob and I taught here in Adelaide and he became head of physics at Flinders. It was Ian McCarthy who clarified that it was like the honours degrees were like the laws of thermodynamics. Now, a lot of you here will know that there used to be three laws of thermodynamics, the first law, the second law and the third law. Then an even more fundamental quantity was discovered and it's called entropy. And I'll have a little bit to say, about, say about, uh, about entropy. So there needed to be another law and more fundamental than the first three. So that was the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And Tony Thomas's honours, honours physics degree in Flinders was apparently a zeroth order honours degree. Uh, ds is greater than or equal to dq over t bob isn't it uh, the zero th the zero floor well please note with entropy every one of us here in this room is working at the rate of about a minimum of 200 watts even when we do nothing now if you move it all the 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 unavailable energy to keep it a, as a constant temperature animal increases now, there are seven billion of us on this, on this planet, but it's not only Homo sapiens who are constant temp temperature animals, it's all the other animals, the cats and the dogs and the pigs and the cows and the goats and the sheep and the horses and the elephants and the camels, all of whom are generating unavailable energy entropy. Now, where's this, where's this entropy going? I can tell you where it's going. It's going into global warming. And if there are any people here who are inclined to say there's no such thing as global warming, I say disrespectfully, you are idiots. <laughs> We're doing it constantly and continually. Well, secondly, I was privileged to chair the May 1986 centenary of the, of the uh, appointment of, uh, of, of physics to, to Adelaide. Uh, I persuaded and I, I chaired the, uh, the thing and I edited the, uh, the, the proceedings. I persuaded the University Council, uh, uh, no, Foundation. Does the Foundation still exist? It funded all sorts of very interesting activities. I persuaded the foundation to fund the visiting professors, Stephen Bragg. Now, Stephen was the grandson of Sir William and the son of Sir Lawrence Bragg. So we, we, we funded Stephen Bragg, Freeman Dyson, Frank Close, Paul Davies, and Brian, Matthew, Brian Matthews. And you've heard that Brian apologises for his absence today. Now, it was Brian who gave the commemoration address in the, on the 2nd of May, 19, 1986. Now, Brian was a former... Uh, Brian was a former PhD student of mine. I'm sorry, that's dead. Yeah, good. <laughs> and there were two of them, Brian, Brian Matthews and Peter Coleman, both of whom got... Uh, uh, the highest university degrees, the doctor of the uh, doctor of the university. Now he, with uh, Tony Thomas, uh, gained the doctor of science degrees. It is perhaps of, uh, of interest that one of them doctors of philosophy was Bruce Robert Dunt Dawson, the chair of this, uh, the head of physics, and the chair of this this uh, this this occasion. Uh, he's the present head of physics. And as you know, I've been mixed up a lot in the theatre and Union Hall and I might have something to say about the vandalistic destruction <laughs> of, the, <laughs> of Union Hall. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> there's a play. One of the plays we did 
my late wife and I saw the, saw the play uh, uh, Waiting for Godot. And I'm sure the people here who know that uh, know that play, Waiting for Godot. It's a fascinating play. We saw its premiere in, the, in, the, in England. And we staged it here in Union Hall. It was, it was remarkable. There are a couple of fascinating lines in Waiting for Godot. First one is, time passes, as it has done for Bruce Dawson. Time passes. <laughs> and the response was, it would have passed anyway. <laughs> now, they are truisms about which you can do absolutely nothing. Well, I was compulsorily retired at the end of 1985, but I maintained my interest and involvement in, the, in physics. In particular, I was particularly in interested in course number 2934, Physics, Man and Society, it was known as. It was a first year course for 24 students from the Arts and Humanities who had done no physics and no mathematics whatsoever, right? It was my task to cause them to, and I use the word deliberately, to comprehend, to comprehend the 16 great principles of classical mechanics, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, quantum mechanics, special and general rel relativity, and I'm immodest enough to say that I did indeed do so. <laughs> that course is a fascinating course. Well, it was then in the late 80s that a group known as the L-cubed group appeared. L-cubed stands for lunatic, lesbian, left. <laughs> they failed abysmally to comprehend that the word man was a collective noun. Had no gender connotations whatsoever. Uh, in spite of that, the department, however, agreed to change man to the non-synonymous and totally inadequate word ideas. So I quit. <laughs> <laughs> albeit, albeit sadly. Um. Yeah. Uh, I wish finally to generalise somewhat. I spent quite some time doing research into, into proteins and uh, nucleic acids, DNA. Now, I'll just digress uh, to bring you into the picture a little bit. The ancient Greeks knew that the diagonals of a pentagram, now a pentagram is a regular equal five-sided figure. The cross diagonals divide each other in what was called the golden mean. They, uh, they did not know its value, but they gave it the, let the Greek letter phi, and phi is the symbol for the, uh, for the golden mean. But it was the Pisa scientist, anyone in the 12th century, can anyone tell me his name? Fibonacci. It was the Pisa scientist Fibonacci in the 12th century AD who showed that the sequence of any whole numbers A and B, A, B, go on, and the sequence is formed by adding the previous two, two numbers in the sequence. So with A and B, and the only condition there is that they should be whole numbers, and A has to be less than or equal to B. So the sequence goes A, B. The next term in the sequence is A plus B. The next is A plus 2B. Then 2A plus 3B. And I can see Rod shaking his head, nodding his head there. He knows exactly what I'm, uh, I'm getting at, I'm, uh, I'm sure. So it goes 2A plus 3B, 3A plus 5B, 5A plus 8B, 8A plus 13B, 13A plus 21B, and so on, 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 right to the end. Fibonacci showed that for all those sequences, the ratios of the last two, two terms in the infinite sequence, irrespective of the value A and B, is always 1.618033. Nine, eight, nine, blah, 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 blah. 
and that's a, it, it, it is a fasc, it is a fascinating number. Now that number one point six one eight eight double three nine at nine is the golden mean. It has all sorts of fasc, fascinating properties. You square it, Rod, as you know, and it becomes two point six one eight zero double three nine eight nine. Now proteins have ratios of their amino acids that fit in with three point six one eight zero double three nine eight nine. And I could spend the whole of the rest of this morning telling you about, uh, about the golden mean. Well, I found in 1964 that with the B form of DNA, the keeper chain, now DNA is, is, is a helix, so the coding chain, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, these three things code, three of them code for an amino, amino acid of which there are 20, the 21st, we can't uh, pick up, we have to synthesize it to make the, uh, I think it's called methionine. methionine. But uh, these, uh, these things always, always code for the, uh, for the golden mean. And in DNA, the keeper chain divides the repeat in the golden mean. Now you've all got DNA in there and it's all being divided, the keeper chain is dividing its code coding chain in the golden mean. Now I also found there are many examples, Barbara, as we know, of, uh, of, the, of the golden mean in the amino acid sequences that make up our, uh, our protein. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating quantity. Well, it's even more fascinating because the medieval artist Dürer, was it Hans Dürer? You know, the medieval artist Dürer and other artists painted many naked, nude and naked women, and they d divided them by their navel in the golden, the golden mean. Now, it was about 50 years ago that the Scientific American Journal got its mathematicians to measure their wives. <laughs> and they found that their navels did not divide them in the golden mean, but it was it was higher than the golden mean. So they, the Scientific American called the women the hi-fi women because so it's, it's not the golden mean, it's greater than the golden mean. I would like uh, briefly to return, as I said, to, uh, to Bragg House. Bragg House is the house that Bragg built on 207 East Terrace, Adelaide. Now, it was when Jane Lomax Smith was Lord Mayor that she got that house placed on the uh, provisional list of the State Heritage Authority. Now, in 2004, there were three people from the Physics Department. They were Peter Veach, Rod Cruther, and Harry Medlin, who took this, this uh, provisional arrangement up with the, uh, with the Heritage Authority, and we got the provisional uh, arrangement confirmed. So Bragg House on 207, and there are photographs here, and I'm sure there are photographs there. Bragg House on 207, East Terrace, Adelaide, is permanent, permanently uh, uh, collected. The provisional thing was, was, was validated, uh, as distinct from what happened to the provisional registration of Union Hall, where Minister Caker uh, cancelled the thing, and, well, Professor, we all know what's happening to Union Hall. <laughs> And let's hope that something good uh, does come out. The interesting thing about Union Hall is that I have here photographs of the, uh, of the, the Ham Funeral. Um, the Ham Funeral was a play written by Patrick White. Patrick White is the only Australian ever to have been awarded the Nobel Prize for, uh, for Literature. And if you read the citation, you'll see it refers to the plays. We did the world premieres of, of the three Patrick White plays, The Ham Funeral, The Season of Sarsaparilla, and Night on Board Mountain. And I hope, uh, I don't suppose I'll ever see it, but I hope to see another Nobel laureate arise out of the sight of the uh, 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 Union Hall. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, Mrs. Scarce, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my distinct uh, pleasure to open this Physics History Symposium, as I now do. Thank you.